This video is about mobile marketing, marketing automation and growth hacking. So welcome to Profile 3 TV, coming to you from the Innovation Factory in the Springfield Road and today we're joined by Rachel Davis from Hurry. So Rachel, thank you very much for coming in today and, and uh, joining us. Do you mind telling all of our viewers uh, all about Hurry and, and what you guys sure. do? Yeah, so as you say, my name is Rachel Davis. I am the co-founder and CMO of Hurry. We are a marketing automation platform for apps. So essentially, um, what used to be the case is apps would have sent push notifications, but they would have been hard-coded into the background. So marketers really wouldn't have had a say on um, what the content is, when it went out, things like that. Um, we actually allow the marketer to be able to send those push notifications at the time that best suits their user with a wee bit of um, machine learning in the background there. Um, so we, uh, Hurry will learn um, when your user actually is most likely to open the push notifications mm -hmm. um, so that you're confident that you're sending the right content to the right user at the right time. Amazing. So if it's a young person, maybe Friday night might be the best time as opposed to Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. Absolutely, <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, that that's the beauty of it as well. We, we are quite big into our segmentation. That's kind of a big oh. um, selling point for us, as in our, our hurry dynamically changes your segments. So as a marketer, the best practice is to always have your buyer personas. Who are they? Um, but essentially what happens is if you do it in a PowerPoint, if you do it on a page, stick them in your top drawer and never look at them again, which isn't very useful to anybody. So what Hurry actually does is it um, learns by the rules that you've created. So you maybe want um, single females as opposed to single males, and it'll divide that based on your rules. And now that maybe is a bad example because I'm going to say that changes, but you know, um, depending on your buyer behavior, maybe you're someone that really likes Chinese food and mm -hmm. another person really likes Indian food, maybe the more you go into the app and change and chop your choices, you could then be moved dynamically into the person that likes Indian food okay. so that the marketer is again confident that they are sending you the right, most relevant information for you. Incredible. So wow, so you guys know everything that anyone does on their mobile phone. Well, not us specifically, the companies that use are yeah. <laughs> Incredible. No, it's amazing. And um, you know, so many levels to a business marketing themselves. Mm. You know, you think of the website, you think of social media. Yeah. Of course mobile is critical. Yeah. Because nearly everyone's got a mobile phone now. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. A, addicted to the whole stuff, eh? it's yeah. like uh, uh, even I'm, I'm thinking you know in five or six years will will we have laptops and desktops or will it will it all be mobile devices? So Yeah, I think I think there'll be a place for both because you have this whole thing of the double screen so you know you're watching your tv but you're on your ipad checking out you know what you're actually going to buy on asos or something like that so I, I think there's a place for both because people even if you actually look at buying habits people tend to spend more when using an ipad as they would on their phone um so there's just different different traits of people um wow. and how you would actually buy using your different devices Incredible, so I didn't know that. There's my lesson for today. So, so basically I should be watching and paying care more attention to people who visit my website, uh, for example, if they're on their iPad because of potentially Well, yeah, it depends it depends what um you're doing. So it's obviously it's all really when it comes down to about your mobile strategy yeah. and your mobile marketing strategy. So you obviously have one for your desktop which is you know your site will be nice and optimized for mm -hmm. desktop but there is this whole element of your mobile site needs to be optimized for the mobile user um, and if it's not that just turns people off straight away they go do something else because they get frustrated if there's too much like chunkiness about it it's just too difficult um, if you have it nicely laid out maybe even take out elements of your site you know figure out what people actually want, are going to be looking for your um site for whenever they're using mobile they need something quick fast yeah. snappy whereas if someone's on desktop they have a bit more time they're probably more likely sitting down somewhere a bit more time mm -hmm. whereas if you're on your move on the move you know you don't really have that time of course exactly so less you and actually we have a similar strategy so sounds like we're on the same page <laughs> which is really really good so basically you would 
uh, anticipate having less data, less content on the mobile? Yeah, person. sort of focus more on Recording. really getting down to the specifics of mm -hmm. what people want from you um, and analyze that and only stick to those points. It's very easy as a marketer to go, oh no, but they need to know this and they need to know that. Just get right down to the basics on what they're there for mm -hmm. and what you want them to do as well and help them down that journey. You know, there is an awful lot, you know, it's all, there's a lot of different terms that are floating about at the moment and user experience is definitely one of them. And it really is so important that you do acknowledge that there is a difference between desktop and mobile and that you tailor your user journey on both. Now it does take a little bit of effort and it does take a little bit of experimentation, but it is so worth it in the end whenever you've got that right or you see that you're starting to get it right. It really makes a massive difference to you and obviously revenue. <laughs> it's incredible, yeah, most important. Yeah. So who would be a typical customer that would come to uh, your company for help? Um, so basically our target market is anybody with an app. Wow. So we have different types of people, right from the enterprise mm -hmm. market, which has hundreds, thousands of users, right down to the smaller app companies that don't don't have that many. Um, our platform is built out for both of them and there's a place in each marketing department for both. You know, you get the smaller companies, they don't really have the time or the resources um, to actually dedicate specifically. They may not have a pure marketing person. Mm -hmm. So actually having this marketing automation tool helps them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you look at the bigger enterprise companies, they're looking at the more detailed side. So they really care about this segmentation piece. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, coming down the line, what hurry, what impact hurry is gonna have on being able to know their customers without their marketers having to actually get any better. Essentially, you know, they've obviously employed great marketers, mm -hmm. but they're there to do the thinking, not the repetitive tasks, yeah. you know? Of course, no, uh, sounds amazing. So uh, do you think the app market then is, is getting more competitive of people? Is there more and more apps being produced by companies? Yeah, definitely. Um, One thing I would have to say in it is, um, it's very important for people to understand why they're building an app. So you have companies that sort of, the impression is that you need to have an app. Apps are the latest thing. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely think apps are great mm -hmm. if you use them for the right reason. So for instance, you see Amazon, they started as a website, but obviously their app their app alone, interesting fact for you, their app alone um, on Cyber Monday last year had doubled from the year before. Wow. Right? That's the revenue that came in from that. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Yeah. Um, but if you even look at, that's an online business. But if you look at somewhere like Caesars Entertainment, so like Caesars Palace, mm -hmm. they have actually diversified their business to include apps. Now, you're probably wondering, how the heck does a casino do that, right? Yes. So they have it in a couple of different ways. So number one, if you are in Caesars Palace or any of their casinos, you can actually, instead of disrupting your game, you can use your app to go to order a drink and then they'll bring your drink down to you to stop disrupting your game. Now, there's also the idea that, well, I kind of want to be part of this brand and use this brand when I'm not in Vegas. Wow. So they have other gambling apps that you can use when you're not in Vegas as well. So that's a good use of how to diversify your brand when using an app. There's plenty, there are plenty of people out there that are trying to jump on this app bandwagon, mm -hmm. but I'd have to say unless you have a real need for it or your customers have a need for it, don't invest because it actually it costs quite a lot of money mm -hmm. to develop a really good app that has a really good user experience that is gonna be worth your investment as well. Amazing, so really good advice. So you, you, same as us, we go back to start and don't spend money and, and yeah. things that will work that you don't need for your business. Absolutely, the, yeah. The, the bright shiny things, like mm. it sounds amazing, like oh, to have an app, but yeah. is it the right thing for your business? And, uh, yeah, and I think as well as that, it's very important that 
I mean, obviously we're a piece of marketing automation software, mm. but we're a small business as well. And in order to maximize um, what we get out, mm -hmm. we actually use a lot of marketing automation ourselves. So we would track how people are using our website. So from behind the scenes, I mean, you don't see the ins and outs of it, but you can just see their journey through mm -hmm. your website. And this allows us to understand how they're using it. What we can improve for next time, is that button even necessary? Should we take that away? Is it just causing confusion? Mm -hmm. And it's things like that, those key pieces of technology that do not cost very much money in the grand scheme of things, but will actually bring you a lot more money overall. You know, it's investing properly on the technology that you have. Incredible, yeah. So it's not a set and forget strategy. Yeah. Just yes, absolutely. I've got my site up or my apps built. Yes. Job done. You need to you need to keep analysing it constantly. It's not as you say, it's not a closed book on right, done next. You know, it's you have to keep have it. to keep looking at it. Wow. And and do you guys and your your team do you work with uh, iOS and Android? Yes. So currently it's iOS and Android. Mm -hmm. They're probably in the new year will be um, native um, well. software development kits as well. But mainly right right now it's iOS and Android. Brilliant. And is it do you find it, is it skewed towards iOS or Android or? Is, um, or not really. Like what we're finding is that there's both. Like if you mm -hmm. have one, you have the other. Most will start with one. Yeah. Um. We are seeing more of a demand as well for the native apps, which allows both um, iOS and Android. But um, right now, it's it's pretty much if you have one, you have the other. And our platform allows for that. So you can send push notifications. You get the choice because they look quite different mm -hmm. on the different types of phones. So as a marketer, you don't need to know any of the code. You can just hit a button and that allows you to do it for iOS or one for Android, you know. Incredible. And and um, I can just imagine that it's so, so competitive now in the app stores, yes. whether it's iOS or mm -hmm. Android. Uh, so actually having a little bit of an unfair advantage or a fair advantage mm -hmm. using marketing support, yeah. it, it really makes a big difference. So you, your software then will look at metrics on how an app's performing? And so we are everything from once you have got your app up onto the app store, mm -hmm. we help you try and retain your users and, and like wow. increase their lifetime value with you. So that would be through the tailored push notifications mm -hmm. and the segmentation. That's our idea that essentially if you're sending the right content to the right user at the right time, you're going to be providing more um, value to your user and they're not going to delete your app for photo storage or something, you know. Um. Yeah, like the, I, I'm, I'm sure because I've done it loads of times. Yeah, I've downloaded so many apps mm -hmm. and I've tried it once and maybe someone's recommended an app, download it, come back to it. Never do, and as you say, it's storage, and yeah. you go, and it's like the first ones to go, are the ones you never use. Yeah. Um. So there is a big risk with that. Is yeah. People download and then never use it. And that's the thing. Whenever you have an app, you're competing with a lot more than the people in your category. You're competing with every app that's available plus everything else that's on your phone. You know, so um, you really need to show that value, and if you really look at it different people I know I have about four pages of apps on my phone <laughs> but I actually only use three maybe four yeah, you know the rest of them just sort of sit there dormant and I never really open them so as, as long as you can provide value and make sure that I mean sense is required as well you're not sending push notifications and emails and things like this at, at a ridiculous rate to people because yeah. at the end of the day they're human on the other side <sighs> Switch it off. You need to you need to just have a bit of sense, have a bit of confidence in yourself as well that you're doing the right thing and hold your nerve when it comes to sending the communication pieces, you know. Incredible, very good. So so apps it's it's still a growing market though, mm -hmm. I guess, no matter what I think of young children now. Oh yeah. Wow, almighty, well, they're like digital natives from like probably well, three, two, one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. As soon as they can lift the phone, uh, it's crazy. They're, they're on it. Yeah. So um, apps are going to become more and more important, I guess, for businesses. Yeah, and I, I also think that what's starting to happen, and it's actually my sister, my goodness, 
she teaches me about new things but not not in a way that she teaches me how to use technology it's actually how the younger generations are actually using the technology as in it's not it's not what it was designed to do so for instance she told me the other day that her whole class are in this group on snapchat right and i was like why <laughs> what do you need that yeah. for um i sort of just thought it was just about the crack at the weekends yeah. and things like that no it actually wasn't at all it's they are actually using snapchat as a collaboration tool wow. i know you wouldn't have thought at all i couldn't even have guessed that they were using that for that so what they were doing was for instance if someone was stuck on their maths homework Someone would say, listen, I'm really stuck on question two. I have no idea how to do it. Does anyone have how to do this? They would send a picture of that and their workings out into the group and, it, and they would be helping each other to get better. So for me, whenever she showed me that, I was I, like, Amazing. I don't get shocked really easily, <laughs> but I just couldn't believe that that was how that app been has used. been transformed by the users and it got me thinking do people like do the teachers actually understand that this is a collaboration tool like that is class mm -hmm. that's a really good use of technology and actually it shows that teamwork is alive now you know people go to university and they hate teamwork they hate it so much but actually when you look at how technology is impacting lives that if you ask my sister she wouldn't even say that technology is impacting it she wouldn't even recognize that just, that's what's happening it's her life. that's, that's just it. her life it's incredible because like you say like the young people now it's the the brought up like, mm, yeah you just move uh, and it's great it really is watching them and learning from mm. them that's, that's amazing i'm sure some teachers are having a heart attack i'm sure they are <laughs> oh i'm sure goodness. but you know what i think that's the big thing as well i think the skills also need to recognize yes. that they can't fight this this is going to happen regardless mm -hmm. so I, I do think that taking advantage of different things like that would really make a massive, massive difference. Um, I know my, my younger cousin at the weekend was telling me, God love her, about her school bag being so heavy. And all I think of is, why is there an app for that? Why are all of her school books not in an app? Because that would save her back. You know, it's, it's all these things that technology can help yeah. prevent problems, different yeah. problems in different yeah. areas. Could write notes on the books yeah, and uh, exactly. annotate and uh, yeah color. to adapt to their lear learning styles. Yeah. As you say, they they're grow they've grown up with this technology, but then go to school with books. <laughs> you know, it's a it's just a bit mental. It baffles me really, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, like I have a young son who um, I think he's always eight now, but I think maybe two years ago we got his r report back and. Um, and his IT skills, he was, uh, we had to, one of our tasks at home was to help him uh, use a mouse. Because mm -hmm. he hadn't used a mouse before, oh, yeah. didn't know what to do. Yeah. And I'm thinking, in reality, he probably, he'd yeah, never see a mouse scroll again. It, yeah. That was, that was <laughs> probably his first time to see a mouse. Yeah. His, his old boy, his yeah. old, old man used yeah. to remember what a mouse was. My father, yeah. he'd be telling kids that my father used to use one of those things. Yeah. He's what never is this it. device? Yeah, 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 that's it. It's incredible, incredible what's happening. But uh, what to do? And there's different types of mobile marketing then. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say are the main ones? Well, to be honest with you, I would say that in order to have a mobile marketing strategy, it's kind of just the plan that you have for your marketing via mobile. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit earlier about making sure you optimize your site and things like that. You don't actually, in order to have a mobile strategy, you actually don't need to have an app. So it's actually more about how you facilitate your customers or your users via mobile. So it is that having your mobile uh, website optimized, that, that can be part of it. Um, emails, so obviously people very much get their email on their phone now. Um, but if you do have a mobile, if, if you do have an app, obviously there's different elements that you bring in there, your push notifications, your in-app messages, and actually bringing that all together in sort of um, multi-channel marketing. So picking up whether people prefer push notifications or do certain type of messages, are they better in, um, in push notifications or are they better via email? Mm -hmm. Like so for instance, 
um, push notifications, you can deep link straight into your app. So for instance, if someone had looked at a specific skirt that they were gonna buy or something, and the push notification said about that, now obviously they're more likely to buy that if they open it and it takes them straight to that page, rather than if they click the notification and it just opens up a random page on your app. You know, it's just different things like that, trying to connect the dots as to, again, going back to this user experience and what really, what they're really there to do and how mobile impacts their end goal, your end goal, which is to get them to buy from you. Very good, excellent. And obviously your business is built as a marketing automation tool. Mm -hmm. So for a few people who maybe are watching and don't fully understand what mm -hmm. marketing automation is, do you mm -hmm. mind just explaining what that is? Sure, well, it's essentially the idea of using a tool to automate the repetitive tasks. So for instance, if you spend ages creating, as a marketer, if you spend ages creating your social media, you know, before it would have been, you know, either on Twitter, just pushing it out, pushing it out, hitting a button. I mean, there is no person on this planet that is not too expensive to do that. That is ridiculous use of your time. You can now get tools such as Hootsuite that can do this all for you. If it's maybe, um, if it's maybe emails that you're looking to do, um, and get them sent out um, at different timings to meet your sort of requirements. Maybe it's MailChimp. If you need to do both and maybe schedule blog posts, there's other tools such as HubSpot. So there's plenty of tools out there to help you get over those sort of repetitive tasks. Um, so you have big brands such as Rip Curl. So Rip Curl is a retailer, manufacturer, a major athletic sponsor um, based from Australia. Their biggest thing is they have customers all over the world. Now, it would be absolutely pointless for them to have someone hitting the button for all the different time zones for that particular email that needs to go out. And uh, what they do is they automate this so that it can go to each time zone, which is great. Now they're obviously business to consumer. There's the other side, which is um, business to business. Mm -hmm. Now automation can also fit in this sort of um, cool. category as well. For instance, there um, is a great example of a data center solutions provider called mm -hmm. Centrix IT. And they never had any form of marketing automation. They just essentially had to deal with everything. Everything was manual. So as soon as a lead came in, the per marketing manager got all of the leads into her inbox and then she then needed to divvy them out. Now, there's a couple of different problems with that. You've got human error. You've got the fact that she clocks off nine to five. So there's a whole evening where that isn't being automatically divvied out. Um, and now what happens actually is they've created a landing page that each landing page goes to a specific salesperson. So that it always goes into the right person's inbox and they can action it. So instead of having that barrier in the middle, within the first year of them having this automation, um, their lead generation via online traffic increased by 59% and 1.5 million pounds turnover increased directly attributed to this. So as you can see, automation really can make a massive difference in both B2C and B2B. Yes, um, incredible because you can't you just can't be everywhere yeah you just can. can't and it's it's mainly there to let the humans do the thinking and the creative strategy mm. and let the let the technology do the stuff that you wouldn't really want to do yourself you don't want to be sitting there pressing a button and um, to hit go you know totally. you need to be doing the, the things that you're paid to do which is be the bigger thinker you know of course and the world now is like global so mm. global time zones Exactly, it's such a massive thing. Yeah, incredible. So growth hacking mm -hmm. is another term that we hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, so in case anyone hasn't heard of growth, growth hacking, you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit about that? Sure. Well, growth hacking really is, I mean, I feel it gets, uh, it was sort of something that was a couple of years ago because everyone thought there was a magic sauce. Uh, <laughs> a magic sauce. You mean to, there's not? There is definitely <laughs> no magic sauce to marketing. It is just hard work. But growth hacking is essentially um, trying to engage your customers and users and potential customers 
in such a way that they cling on to your brand and share it. Um, and this is great. In, in the old days, you would have called it word of mouth. <laughs> we still sort of call it word of mouth, but it's actually being passed on and passed on. Now, there's different ways that you can do that now. And it all completely depends on your business. So there's plenty of different examples out there if you Google them on different great growth hacks. Um, one particular one is when uh, Airbnb first started. Mm -hmm. uh, they use sort of stood on the shoulders of giants really and um, had a hack that involved Craigslist. So obviously their users would be on Craigslist. Yes. So they sort of lent on that technology um, until Craigslist could do something about it <laughs> um, to get them away. But <laughs> things like that are quite creative. But for everybody else that maybe doesn't have that ability, like that obviously is great for that type of business. Sometimes growth hacking kind of involves just an awful lot of experimentation. Um, and for that, it's really important that you ha have quite... While it's quite a creative thing, learning to growth hack, mm -hmm. you need to have a very structured way of understanding it and a structured way of managing it. So writing down exactly what it is that you're testing, um, what you hope to see, sort of your hypothesis, and what you actually see so that you can change that, you know, give it a very tight deadline mm -hmm. um, and move on to the next, you know, evolution of that experiment. And there are, again, great... Um, great tools online for that such as Optimize is a really really good one it can help you structure um, all the experiments that you you put forward really um, but definitely I think it is something the experiments part of sort of the growth hacking and trying to get I mean there are viral growth hacks which is that sort of Airbnb one which you know is grabs traffic really quickly mm -hmm. but this idea of experimentation that is something that every business should be doing um, to get further really. Amazing. And I can see that you're very focused on stats and data yeah. and <laughs> metrics and measurements, which is a really, yeah. really good sign. So if anyone watching this um, video was interested in reaching out to yourselves sure. and getting some help with mobile marketing, mm -hmm. what's the best way or had questions on mo mobile optimization or uh, sure. uh, what's what's the best way to get in touch? Um well Add me on LinkedIn. I'm on there, Rachel Davis. Uh, you can also go to our website, which is hurry.co. So that's H-U-R-R-E-E.co. Um, we have a whole blog and resources section there on um, mobile marketing, right from what to do before you launch an app, what to do after you launch an app, and really everything in between. So, Excellent. Well, thank you, Rachel. I've been in the blog. It looks impressive. I'm going to have to dig. I've left the page open on my laptop, so I'm going to have to <laughs> dig a wee bit into the content and educate myself some more. But thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, no much appreciated. And thank you for watching our video today. Uh, this is um, Profile 3, Kieran from Profile 3, the content marketing agency, coming to you from the Innovation Factory up on the Springfield Road. Join us tomorrow for the next video, and thank you again for your time.